the 44th chapter. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans, the 8th chapter. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longings for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childhood until now. And not only the creation, but we, <clears throat> excuse me, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. But who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for, as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. 
The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. This morning's text is taken from the Epistle Lesson of Romans chapter 8, beginning at the 26th verse. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There was a little boy, came in after playing outside with his friends, sat down at the dinner table. His parents looked at him and his mother asked him to go ahead and say the prayer. The boy looked down at his plate, saw the food, picked up his fork and started eating. Well, his parents got upset. His dad told him to put the fork down and asked him why in the world he didn't pray first before he started to eat. Little boy looked at his mom and dad and said, I already prayed for this food. These are leftovers from yesterday. Have you ever been in a situation when you did not find the right words to say? Whether or not you've been at a funeral home when all the words in the world didn't seem to carry the load? Or you might have sat by one's bedside in a hospital setting where they were seriously ill, didn't know what to pray for, whether it's healing or heavenly release. When I was in hospice as a chaplain, my prayers changed with the patient and they changed with the family as the patient began to decline. And oftentimes with family members, we got to a point that I was praying that their loved one would die very rapidly and that God our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ will receive them into their eternal kingdom of heaven. I remember sitting in the movie theater, you might have too, when I first saw The Passion of the Christ. I went with another pastor, a classmate of mine. Sitting there watching this, I came in with mixed emotions. I still have them now on it as well. Thinking, all right, here we go. Here is Hollywood's version, Mel Gibson's version this time, of what the passion may or may not have looked like. On the one hand, I was very impressed because artistically, that's the closest we will ever get to the real thing. On the other hand, there's a lot of inconsistencies and things that just didn't happen. But that's a topic for a Bible study on a different day or over a glass of wine sometime. But when I was going through that movie and watching this, I timed the brutality of Jesus, just the whipping scene alone. That scene alone in that movie was nine and a half minutes long. When that scene of the movie was over, I thought to myself, I want him dead. I don't want Jesus coming back from what he just went through. Because he would never be the same. Watching countless people die, there's a certain tipping point in the dying process that loved ones and even myself as a chaplain did not want them to come back. The reason being is because if they did, they would never be the same at all. They would either be in a vegetative state or their bodies were so turned and twisted that they would just be existing and not even living. During those times, words just don't come. I've done countless funerals as a pastor. It's amazing what people do and say, and many of them are very, very well-intentioned, especially when they're funeral homes. But oftentimes I shake my head and just think, the best thing that they can do is remain silent and just be there for the family members. Despite our stammering or despite our silence, we at least can be reassured and assured from our epistle lesson this morning that the Holy Spirit is at work in you and also for you. 
Our sinful weakness affects every aspect of our lives and living, every part of it. St. Paul has therefore described the present groaning of all creation from the beginning of our lesson in verse 18 all the way through 25. And if the world itself in which you and I live in is already groaning, that raises the question, well, how in the world can we handle it? To go even deeper and more personal than that, what today, here and now, is presently causing you to groan? What hardship or burden are you carrying other than COVID-19 affecting our lives right now? What causes you pain? What causes you suffering? And might even move you to denial. St. Paul then hits it home as he brings to light a very hidden confession in verse 26 where he reminds us and tells us and he himself admits that sometimes he himself does not even know how to pray or even what to pray for. There was a woman that came in to talk with her pastor. She was obviously in pain and also mental anguish and agony. Pastor asked her, he says, have you prayed? The lady said, no, because God wouldn't listen to me, and I don't pray too well. Further discussion led to the admission that she didn't pray because she only wanted relief from her suffering. What she was afraid of, if she were to pray, was to risk hearing that God had a different answer for her than the one that she wanted. Finally, after understanding that prayer is based on God's work of reconciliation and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord, she began to open up her heart and trust God promises. I remember and I know that when people came to me and said, Pastor, I prayed, but God did not answer me. What they were really telling me was the fact that God didn't do what they wanted him to do. God did answer them. He either told them to wait and hang on, or no. They were just not ready to hear it. Prayer, again, is not a blank check, which we fill in and then present to God's throne of grace. Prayer doesn't work that way. If it did, then sinful mankind would be ruling this world. The result will be absolute chaos, conflict, and disorder. As bad as things are now, it would be even worse. Think of the relationship between a parent and a child. A thoughtful parent has a plan for their children. One that is always set up for their success, and one is always best for their welfare. Within the scope of that plan, the wishes, the requests, and the desires of the children are obviously granted. Our Heavenly Father does the same thing with us as His children. Our Heavenly Father has a plan of wisdom and love for you and for me. It's within that plan that He has for us that our prayers are always answered with a resounding yes. Even John reminds us of 1 John 5.14. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that when we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We're going to say it a little bit later in the worship service, it's the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, we will say, Thy will be done. What we never say is, My will be done. It's always God's will, and we ask and pray the Lord there, that he would bend our will to his. The world you and I live in wants it differently and the other way around. We want to bend God's will towards our will, and he says no. That's why, unfortunately, for many people, and yes, that includes Christians, prayer oftentimes starts with us. Our cries, our needs, our moods. Prayer can then stem from the realization that all too often our prayer becomes an attempt to manipulate God 
to satisfy our own desires, our own wants, and our own needs. Even my own mother fell into this trap. If any of you have wondered why in the world I am so tall, well, let me tell you. I had surgery when I was seven weeks old. This is what she told me as I was growing up. At the time I had surgery, I had pyloric stenosis. Matter of fact, I still have to this day, and I'm rubbing it now, my two-inch scar. It's where the esophagus and the stomach comes together that began to close up. I was also born three weeks premature, five pounds and one or two ounces. So as she was feeding me, I was throwing everything up and losing weight. At seven weeks, they had no choice but to get me to the hospital as quickly as possible, and they got me there in time. The doctor went ahead and cut me open, did the surgery, sewed me back up, and slowly but surely, well, I began to grow because I began to eat again. Here's the thing. From the time before my parents got me to the hospital and when I was in the hospital and on that surgery table and even beforehand, my parents and especially my mom was praying and bargaining with God. She told the Lord that if I lived, I will be a pastor. Now, to her dying day, she believed that's exactly what God said was yes. Save me, and therefore I became a pastor. What I could not convince her of was the fact that that was not true. That God all along already had a plan for her, he had a plan for me, he had a plan for the rest of our family and everybody else. And that I became a pastor, not because of her praying and bargaining with God, but rather because he called me throughout life to become one. Kind of interesting, too, how I got here, but again, topic for a different day. But she thought through that prayer, yep, she was able to change God's mind. Watch carefully the Old Testament again, too. You got Abraham. He's praying for all of the people, and not just Lot and his family, but for all of the people, for Sodom, Gomorrah, the other three cities, there were five cities in all, that the Lord will go ahead and spare them. And you remember the story where he prays to God and he starts bringing and lowering that number till he comes down to number 10. He figured anything below 10 and know that would be pushing God way too much. Interesting thing, though, is that there's four people that were saved and very unfortunately Lot's wife her heart was again back in Sodom, turned around, turning the pillar of salt. Three people, less than ten, were saved. Lot and his two daughters. From an outsider's point of view, it looks like manipulation with Abraham's prayer to God. That somehow or another he's changing God's heart when the reality is, God knew all along, number one, what was going to happen, and number two, that he ended up saving three people the number far less than what Abraham asked him to do. Hannah does the same thing. She prays again that for a son that she would dedicate him again to God. Samuel is born. She hands him off to Eli. It looks like again she manipulated and changed God's heart and mind through her prayers. But the reality is God knew all along, no. Samuel will be born. Samuel is going to go with Eli. Eli will train him. Samuel will replace Eli and his corrupt sons. And that's exactly what happened. But as sinful human beings, because we're so used to bargaining with each other, we're so used to wheeling and dealing, Oftentimes we think we could do the same thing with God through prayer. And we often try to use prayer like a magic rabbit's foot. The Lord doesn't work that way. St. Paul reminds us again within our epistle lesson that by nature we don't know how to pray 
We don't know who to pray to. We don't even know what to pray for. As a matter of fact, we have to be taught how to pray and how to pray properly. Because prayer, like everything else in the Christian faith and life, is a holy habit. Watch the Lord's Prayer again very carefully. That was taught. The Lord's Prayer was taught by Jesus Christ to his apostles. Later on today, take a very close look at Luke chapter 11, the first four verses. He teaches the apostles how to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father always sees our true desires. He knows our weaknesses and He knows that it is due to our sin. What prayer in reality is, it's a response to God's holy word to us. Prayer is our half of the conversation which is first begun by God. God has to speak first to us. Otherwise, there's nothing to say and no one to talk to. When you are out of God's holy word, when we step away from holy scriptures, we stop our devotions, we stop our worship life, we stop Bible study, then there's problems because our prayer begins to shrink and shrivel. And then the only time we ever go to God is we smack Him like a panic button. But the deeper we are in God's holy word, the more we are ingrained with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the more we walk with Him as He walks with us, our prayer life deepens. There's far more to say. There's far more to be thankful for, and not just things to ask for. And that relationship is stronger. The key to prayer is always God's word in Christ Jesus, our Lord, to us. No prayer is ever right when there's a false understanding of God's nature and how we communicate with Him. Keep in mind that even heathens, people who are not Christian but are very much spiritual because they're following the wrong spirit, they too pray to their false gods. Prayer, on the other hand, is right when it is prayed in unwavering faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why prayer is a way of communion with God through faith in Jesus. That's why our Heavenly Father listens to us. Because what He hears is the Holy Spirit through His Son from us to Him. Look at it this way. Confession and absolution of sins. That's the benefit of our baptisms in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Prayer is the privilege of it. Confession and absolution is the benefit of our baptism. Prayer is the privilege of it. The other thing over time, too, that I used to shake my head about is every time I used to pass a church and I saw a church sign on the outside that said prayer changes things. No, it doesn't. Prayer does not change things. Prayer changes people. Prayer makes me aware of my dependence on an almighty God. Another myth is also the belief that a Christian can always depend on prayer. Again, the fact is that prayer is never to be depended upon. God is. Prayer is another tool. It's an instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to connect us to Him. That's why God's grace is evident in that the fact that the Holy Spirit rescues us from our own weakness and actively intercedes for us. That's why the repentant heart always screams out to God, what will I do? The answer is always the same. Let God do it for you. That's why as part of His work of sanctifying and keeping us holy, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. You cannot have a better ambassador than God himself. And that's exactly what you and I have. The third person of the Holy Trinity. If you want a prime example of this, watch very carefully Matthew chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3. 
Jesus was coming down from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus heals a man there who is covered in leprosy. Scholars believe he came out of a leper colony. Our Lord knows what's in the man's heart because the Holy Spirit told him. And Jesus goes out and he touches the man to heal him. This is what I love about it, and I always use this every time I did a hospital call with people. The man never asked to be touched. The only thing the man wanted was healing. But if this man had a wife, if he had children or close friends, he could not kiss, hug, or even shake hands with them. He was unclean because of the leprosy. The Holy Spirit, we're told there by Matthew, and translates his heart to Jesus Christ. His deepest need to him, and Jesus goes ahead and he touches him. Our Lord heals him from the inside out, not just physically, but spiritually, mentally, and emotionally too. That's why the grace of our Lord Jesus touches and reduces every aspect of our lives. He died. And he rose to bring us this grace which the Holy Spirit has poured into your heart and into mine. Spoken within our ears and placed upon our lips. Our focus is to be on the working of the Holy Spirit and the freedom we have as God's children in prayer. And not on our style or even the words we use. Because God's grace in Christ is always the key. I had a professor that taught differential diagnosis in my counseling course. He started talking about prayer one day in class. He was a good Christian man. And he said that the shortest prayer that has ever been spoken off of any human being's lips is only one word. That prayer is help. Help. And he's right, that God our Heavenly Father hears that prayer because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I've heard very eloquent and very lengthy prayers. I've always fallen asleep during worship services in the seminary, in the chapel, hearing those prayers. Wondering who pulled out a thesaurus and how many adjectives from A through Z are they going to apply to God? He knows why he we're here. He knows what we're going to ask for. He knows what we need and not just what we greed. Eloquent words he doesn't care about. He cares about the heart and what's on it and what's in it. And he cares about us. I've heard other prayers where people have fumbled stumbled, choked up, forgotten where they were, got choked up to the point that the tears came, but the words did not. Those prayers to me meant more to God than all the eloquent, lengthy ones that I have heard. God's grace in Christ is the key to prayer. It's the key to everything. This is why we can now open our hearts, as St. Paul says, and call our Heavenly Father, Abba, meaning Dear Daddy. This is why Luther himself even said that prayer is a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. Again, amazing to me, people have no problem talking to somebody else, and all of a sudden they clam up when it comes to prayer. I still have to smile and shake my head, even in Bible studies, when... I open the floor to someone to open us with prayer and to close us with prayer. And all of a sudden, all the eyes close, all the heads go down, all the hands hold, and everyone wants to be a little mouse squaring towards that door, going, really? The Lord again knows what's here and why we're here. He just wants to hear it from us. But rest assured that you and I are covered in prayer. The Holy Spirit intercedes, he translates our misdirected and inarticulate words and voices our silent desires so that our, our petitions, our requests are always, as St. Paul says in verse 27, in accordance with God's holy will. 
There will be times in your life, there will be times again in mine that already has been in your life that has been in mine as well. Where we've been overwhelmed by our circumstances, we can't find the right words. And that's okay. Because as we bring our requests before God, some things are just too deep for words. And in very inexpressible ways, the Holy Spirit is there to intercede on our behalf by translating our hearts to God our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we take comfort in. That's what we take comfort that we can bring anything at all before God because the Holy Spirit communicates for you and he does it for me. He relays our message even though we fail to say it so that it gets through in a very God-pleasing way. Our Heavenly Father loves us. He sent His Spirit to live within us. He does it through His Holy Word and His sacraments. And the Spirit goes about His work of sanctifying and keeping us for all time and for all eternity. God bless you as you continue to live out your Christian life with those holy habits, including prayer, knowing the fact that, again, our Heavenly Father has you covered because of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We rise for the prayers of the church.
and we thank you, praise you, dear Lord, that you have already been ahead of them, as well as with them now. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we ask and pray to you with Nathan, Jenny, and John, and that you give them the need of peace and guidance they need for decisions that they are making in life. A lot of the times the burdens of life that we care are too heavy for us. And all we see here more are the problems rather than the solution, which is you. Continue to lead them towards you as they lead upon you for guidance and peace in the present as well as the future. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And with thank you, praise you, and ask for the protection hand again for those in the military, for Kenneth, for Kyle, for Calvin, Andrew, Clay, Clark, Joey, John, Seth, and Raymond. We thank you, dear Lord, for giving them hearts of service and also respect and understanding for this great nation and the freedom we enjoy to worship you. We ask and pray that you continue to guard and protect them as they serve to protect this great land of ours. And we thank and praise you, dear Lord, again that you are with them and ask them that they would ask you that you would always be with them and that you would draw them close to you as well as to each other and the comrade in arms, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. These and all of the petitions we have in our eyes we bring before you silently. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray all this in the name of our Redeemer, the first and the last, the eternal, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Provides for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is to the good white and salutary that which is at all times and in all places. Give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and everlasting God. For the countless blessings that you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him out of sin. Give him into death that we will not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again in new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Trust in him. 
We give you thanks for the redemption that you prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we will faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of this cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in this body and blood. Hear us as we pray within his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, thou be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
that's that's why I play live anyway. When I started, uh, I started almost three years ago. They they gave me the uh, they let me do it. Yeah. And I thought, well, they kept on having me do this too. And I thought, well, this is just uh, this is just something we want to do. Just supplant the national park that we need to do this now. That they need money to do So I'm, I'm glad I, I that's the only thing I tell myself to do. I can't do it. Sometimes, well, previously we had a pastor 